Uh, thank you all for joining us for the fourth annual Greater Iowa Credit Union Business Lecture Series. This is the fourth in a series of great lectures uh, that over the years have brought some really interesting speakers here to campus, and we're glad to be continuing that, uh, that offering tonight. Uh, thank you to the folks from the Greater Iowa Credit Union. Uh, my name is David Spaulding. Uh, I'm the new dean of the College of Business here at Iowa State University. Uh, and it's my, uh, my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to this very fascinating uh, evening. This lecture is meant to serve as a springboard for conversation of relevant business topics and to attract, educate, and serve members of the Iowa State University and Ames communities. We're very thankful for the support of the Greater Iowa Credit Union. This is a really great example of a public-private partnership and are the kinds of partnerships that I hope to promote now uh, that I'm here at Iowa State. We also want to thank the Committee on Lectures uh, for their hard work in creating this event. They really do a wonderful job with this series, and I know we'll have many opportunities to attend great lectures uh, here in this hall. So our speaker tonight is David Woolman. David is a contributing editor at Wired and author of The End of Money. In this book, he shares how going cashless will affect the world, your wallet, and the retail, banking, and financial industries. His investigation into the future of money examines an array of virtual and alternative cashless currencies and technologies, including mobile-based banking systems. It also includes a personal experiment of almost a year without cash. David has written for the New York, New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Time, Newsweek, and Forbes. His other books include A Left-Hand Turn Around the World and Writing the Mother Tongue, From Old English to Email. David's 2008 story for Wired about how Egyptian activists used Facebook to mobilize against their government was one of the earliest pieces of long-term, long-form journalism about what would become known as the Arab Spring. The story evolved into The Instigators, an e-book that was nominated for a 2012 National Magazine Award for reporting. David earned his undergraduate degree at Middlebury and a master's at Stanford in journalism. And he also completed a Fulbright grant in Sapporo, Japan. He lives in Portland, Oregon with his wife and two children. We are very excited to have him here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming to Iowa State University our 2013 Greater Iowa Credit Union Business Lecturer, David Woolman. Well, thank you all for, for being here tonight. Uh, it's great to be in, on, on the Silicon Prairie, as they say. Uh, I have a ton of information that I want to share with all of you. Can, you. can you hear me in the back, by the way? Please wave if you cannot. You can. Uh, so what I want to do is briefly tell you uh, about this unusual path that led me toward writing this book. And then I'll dive into some of the, the broad themes and concepts uh, and observations made along the way. And then I, I definitely want to save some time for Q&A. I've found with some experience that it is often uh, the most lively part of the evening. So this whole adventure for me began quite small, as seems to be the case with some of these nonfiction projects. I had run into some newspaper reports about the costs of manufacturing pennies and nickels. This was about 2008, 2009. And at the time, it cost about two and a half cents per unit per penny. It costs about nine or 10 cents per unit per nickel. Now, you do not need to be an academic or an economist to know that those numbers are ridiculous and something is wrong. At the same time, I'd already kind of seen it out there in the press. So what, in what way would I be contributing to the national dialogue about this if I'm just regurgitating uh, a complaint that I've already seen? So after some conversation with my editor, we decided, OK, well, this is wired. We need to think bigger. We need to think for further out on the horizon and we need to pump up the bluster. Let's just kill cash entirely. So I wrote a short essay for Wired uh, on this subject, and I really didn't hold back. You know, most of our world now is moving to the digital realm. Books, 
music, movies, cash is annoyingly analog. And it is expensive, and it is germ-saturated, and it is carbon-intensive. Let's kill it already. You're like halfway through the essay already now. All right, so it's a very short little piece. And what happened to me was, first of all, it was an enormous response. Um, just very quickly, by, by the kind of unscientific metric of reader correspondence. It was, it was a tidal wave for me. Uh, this thing I wrote about Egypt in 2008, it was a huge project for me. I wrote this giant feature. I spent a week over there. I got sick. I really thought it was going to matter. And I think I heard from like three people. <laughs> then you start talking about the cash in people's wallets or the cash that the grandma once folded into a Hallmark card for her birthday. And you suggest that maybe this isn't so hot after all. And people just go bananas. So what happened? What were they saying? More than anything, People's immediate response is, OK, in the cashless future, how will I tip strippers and buy pot? <laughs> it's kind of funny, right? I thought it was kind of funny also, like the first eight or nine times. After you start to get dozens of correspondences from people who are saying this very same thing, and then hundreds, I started to wonder and kind of worry, is this really the most sophisticated defense of cash that people can marshal today? Because if so, I've kind of got it made. But in fact, there, there are other arguments. And people were writing me, first of all, they were hostile and they were mad. Uh, and what I want to do is tick through a few of these different subgroups for you, because their view of the world helps to understand this broader debate about different forms of money. So first off, uh, Christian fundamentalists, they hate me. This is based on a literal reading of the book of Revelation, this idea that if you don't have the mark of the beast, come judgment day, uh, you won't be able to transact buy food, buy water, uh, a blanket, etc. On the upside, you will get to go to heaven, but they seem to sort of dismiss that when they're writing me uh, with all kinds of vitriol. So they don't like this idea of the digital money future because they are convinced that Satan loves digital money because Satan can control the economy from, from his or her bad cave somewhere. In addition, I was hearing from a lot of privacy hawks who, uh, rightly so, you know, forget the digital money future. This is the digital present. Uh, with confusing privacy settings on Facebook and NSA super snooping. People are worried about digital money and having banks and advertisers and Big Brother peering in on their financial lives. So they say to me, so now you're going to get rid of our, the last bastion of privacy, this anonymous means of transaction. So they don't really love digital money. Uh, a lot of people who are kind of gold enthusiasts, we must go back to the gold standard, down with the Federal Reserve types, they were writing me, which was interesting, because I wasn't saying, let's kill the dollar as a currency. I was saying, let's get rid of the physical form. But these individuals seem to jump at any opportunity to mount their argument that we need to go back to the gold standard and call Ben Bernanke all kinds of names. So they're writing to me. In addition to that, I started to hear from people um, who are in debt and who are, um, have a family member who's in debt. And this is where things take a really, um, important and serious turn, you know, much more so than the strippers and pot kind of thing. Because to a lot of people, cash, rightly or wrongly so, they see cash as their ally when it comes to more careful financial behavior and when it comes to spending. And this is articulated well by people who are part of a group called Debtors Anonymous, uh, following a 12-step program just like AA. They say to, to participants at the beginning of the month, Take certain funds out of the bank in cash for your rent, for your gasoline, for leisure perhaps if you have any, uh, for your utilities, etc. And put those funds in separate envelopes for each of those items, earmarked. And that's it. That's your money for, for the month. And through this process, allegedly, people uh, can be more careful with their money. So first of all, on, on the debtors, there's a phenomenon in psychology that they're talking about that is really important to this whole subject. And that is something called pain in spending. Okay, so an economist will tell you that a $100 bill is the same as 10 $10 bills. Is the same as $100 in electronic funds in a bank account that you can deploy by way of a debit card. But anybody who has a pulse will tell you that that is garbage. And we treat that money very differently. We spend that money very differently. And there's something about the tactile form that many people say helps them um, because they're feeling this pain in spending. 
what it, what it feels like to relinquish the funds. So those people are writing to me. I also was not, was not necessarily getting a lot of correspondence from people in the mafia and drug dealers and pimps and tax evaders and everybody across the criminal spectrum. But all of them, everybody loves cash. This anonymous means of transaction, it is the blood that flows in the veins of crime, as one cop told me. So, so they don't like the cashless future. Lastly, there's this population of people who I like to call the tactilians. And they'll say to me, you know, David, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and the logic sort of, uh, it works for me. However, I don't know, there's just something about dealing with cash. There's something about the form, and they'll always go like this. And as an author, it's interesting because I think this um, sentiment tracks so closely with people who don't love e-books. You know, they travel a lot, they get it. They should have a Kindle already. Why are you going to lug all these books around on an airplane? But they say, I don't know, there's just something about reading a book and the smell of the pages, and I want to sit by the fire with a book made from dead trees. And, you know, as an author, I sort of have a foot in both camps. I want people to read the book in whatever format, so I'm, I'm sensitive to that. So what happened with me? All these people are writing to me, um, expressing all kinds of anger, and two things. One is that in the aggregate, this defense of cash and this intense emotional response to the idea of getting rid of, rid of cash was completely contradictory to money today. Most money today is already electronic. It is already zeros and ones on a distant server somewhere. Most of those people writing to me, they use a credit card, they get a direct deposit for, uh, for work, they pay their mortgage online, they're buying stuff from Amazon.com. How much cash do they really have on their person? And what are they using it for? Of course, cash has kind of dug in its heels in corners of the economy, and it, there are good arguments to keep it around that we will get to. But what on earth are these people talking about? What world do they think we live in? And to me, that paradox was important. It, it said that, wow, this subject is worthy of something much more significant than just a quick hit, pugnacious 600-word essay. Then there was this other thing that happened. This one guy wrote me anonymously, of course, uh, and he said, after this huge tirade about the gold standard and Ben Bernanke is the spawn of Satan and, and the Federal Reserve, blah, 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 he said, do you even know what money is? And it really caught me off guard. You know, I felt like I knew, and I know, and I certainly knew the basics uh, that a lot of us learn or will soon learn in, in introductory economics classes about cat money as a medium of exchange and money as a store of value money as a standardized unit of account so that we aren't having all these conversion problems by transacting in microphones and cups of water and auditorium chairs. We all know what a dollar is. We've agreed on that unit and we work with it. I know that stuff and yet I felt like this guy had kind of called me to task a little bit and that if I was going to think and comment intelligently about the future of money and the future of different forms of money, I needed to know more about where it comes from and it's its nature and its machinations. And so this is what I did. I tried to set out um, and answer this question, but through the particular lens of the fate of cash. And yes, trying to argue uh, gently that maybe cash is on the way out, and just maybe that is not such a terrible thing. Now, before you telling you a little bit more about my journey and what I found, I want to talk about hot water for a moment. Because we need to dig in a little bit more to just how powerful of a spell that cash has cast on our hearts and our minds. Think about when you're five or six years old and you lose a tooth and you stick your hand under the pillow and you feel that metallic chill of a coin. From that day forward, these particular objects, they have got their hooks in you. You love this stuff whether you want to admit it, you don't have to be Gordon Gecko, any of it. These objects have real power over our minds and over our behavior. So with the hot water illustration, this is a study that I featured in the book by a group out of the University of Minnesota. And they published this thing in Science, I think 2009, 2010. They took a big group of people, let's say like this room, and they divided them in half. All of these people, they asked everyone to just count out paper money, let's say 10 single dollar bills, and set it down on the table. It's not even their own money. Then with this group, they ask everybody to count out rectangular pieces of just regular old paper, but cut to the dimensions of a greenback, and then just put it down. This is, this is a touch experiment. 
Then they had every individual in, in the sample population put their hand in a pot of hot water. And you had to report back to the researchers on a scale of 1 to 10 how hot you thought the water was and how painful this experience was for you, again, on this scale of 1 to 10. And by a very wide margin, the cash handlers reported that the water was not so hot and didn't hurt so much. This is the power that cash has over us and our psychology. And it was as if the people who had just touched some cash were now suddenly wearing a suit of armor and they, they weren't feeling pain as much. So in a way, this is kind of what we're up against. And it makes me either brave or a total uh, glutton for punishment. It remains to be seen, I think. OK, so I set out, I should say, you know, right away, I'm not an academic. Uh, so I, it was so important to me not to write a white paper about different forms of money and whether or not we should have M1, M2, M3 in the economy, blah, blah, blah. I wanted this to be a journey, and I wanted it to be conversational. So that's where this idea of going cashless for the year comes in. The other goal is to go out and find some really interesting people, people far more interesting than me, who experiences and ideas, sometimes outsized, outlandish ideas, can be a window onto these bigger questions and these bigger subjects uh, in ways that I think uh, are beneficial for us as kind of mainstream consumers of information. So one of the first places I traveled to was Iceland. This was soon after uh, Iceland's banking collapse, which to date is the greatest banking crisis in the history of humanity. And this photo actually I snapped uh, at the top of a building. It was the shell of an office building that had been built during the boom in Reykjavik and now is just empty. Uh, overnight, uh, Iceland's stock exchange lost like 90% of its value and the krona, the national currency, collapsed by like a third or two-thirds of its value. So I went to Iceland to hunt down a woman named Kirsten Thorkel's daughter. And she designed Iceland's banknotes in the late 1970s. And I wanted to talk to her because at the time, Iceland was strongly considering ditching their national currency, the krona, to jump on the euro. Now, for any of you who keep up with this kind of stuff, that sounds very dated because right now Iceland is really happy they are not on the euro. But at the time, this was sort of, this was the direction they were headed uh, because having their own currency was part of their problem during the crisis. So I wanted to go to Iceland to ask these questions about, well, what is the relationship between the state and the money? You know, someone had once written me that getting rid of the greenback, this is like burning the flag. You just don't do that. You know, of course, it's, it's uh, infused with all of these uh, symbols and all of this nationalistic power. And, and it's also one of the last physical touchstones of national identity. You know, how dare you get rid of this thing? And it's, it's interesting. I thought that, that Kristen would be um, lamenting the fact that they might join the Euro. But she was fiercely pragmatic about the whole thing and telling me that the French are no less French because they're on the Euro. Uh, and, Besides, we don't really use cash much here in Iceland anyway. In fact, kids who hold a lemonade stand equivalent in Iceland, they usually are selling baked goods, they will get a credit card reader. And there's another point about Iceland and money that is worth touching on. And this has to do with the fact that in most countries, you can retire certain issues of banknotes. In other words, uh, when there's a new Swedish franc introduced or a new 20-pound uh, note in Britain, they allow a certain amount of time during which you're allowed to go to a bank or some other institution and trade in that money for the newly designed stuff. And after that date, if you are still holding old maid, it is worthless. You could just roll it and smoke it. It's, it's not money anymore, it's just paper. Here in the US, we don't do that. We don't do that, and this is part of, uh, well, there are a lot of interesting reasons why, I think. Um, but it really has to do with the myth-making power of the almighty dollar. US legal tender is for good always and forever. So if you have uh, a two-cent coin from the 19th century that uh, a great-grandparent passed down to you who was a coin collector, you could go spend it as two cents. You'd be an idiot to, of course, because some collector is going to pay you a few thousand dollars for it. But you could do that. And some of this also, ha uh, I should say, is absolutely infuriating to design enthusiasts because the dollar is ugly. And that's not really my assessment. That's sort of the world's assessment. It's hard for us to embrace that fact because, again, you know, we, we love this stuff. Uh, but we don't necessarily love its design. But it's got this crazy uh, collection of weird fonts and this pale, ugly green color and the, the purple five on the fives now. Someone famously said this is like uh, 
a, a denim patch on a satin dress. Or it's, it's this complete mismatch. So Kirsten was talking to me about, okay, well, how do you create this sense of national identity on the paper? What, is it, what does it mean to be Icelandic once you get past fish and sheep? Because you can only put that on a few of the denominations. Then, then what are you going to do? Waterfalls is the answer, by the way. So that was my trip to Iceland. Then I went to Honolulu to meet my man Bernard von Nothaus. That's his name, Nothaus. And he's posing here with his coin press hammer. And von Nothaus is a guy some of you may have heard about in passing. 2007, 2008, he founded something called the Liberty Dollar, which also went by the name of the Ron Paul Dollar, uh, or the Hawaii Dollar, D-A-L-A. And this was meant to be an alternative currency that you could use in lieu of using the dollar. So von Nothaus's experiences and exploits are, are interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, he was convicted of mail fraud, conspiracy, and counterfeiting. And, get this, and the, the quotation marks are essential, one count of uttering and attempting to utter and pass silver coins in resemblance of genuine U.S. silver coins in denominations of $5 or greater. Close quote. So, uh, lest you think that the First Amendment is alive and well, uh, after you leave here tonight, please be cautious about your utterances relating to coinage. So, we're going to talk about alternative currencies a little bit more in a moment, but von Nothaus's experience with the Liberty Dollar uh, is excellent for highlighting what is in fact a very gray area, and that is what level of monetary innovation is and is not permissible under the law. Because we have this term, legal tender, and some of us throw it around. I certainly threw it around before researching this book, and I was using it incorrectly. It does not mean that you have to use this money. Legal tender has to do with debt, so that if I owe you $1,000 in U.S. currency, and then I come to pay up, you can't refuse me and all of a sudden say you want something else. But if you own a pizza shop and you only want to get paid in Bitcoin, or uncut rubies, or auditorium chairs, or favors, or back rubs, or Swiss francs, you can do that. There's no problem there. There are some tax issues later that you have to settle with IRS, but again, you can do it. And von Nothaus's experience it really sheds light on this puzzle because there is all kinds of innovation with alternative currencies, and again, I'll get to that in a moment, and yet he crossed these lines with U.S. Treasury that you that you don't cross. Some of them are vague, some of them not so vague. He walked around wearing t-shirts like, the US Mint can bite me. <laughs> and um, he was openly advertising this as a competitor to the US dollar. Whereas other currency enthusiasts are very careful to say that it's complementary, or it's meant to work in tandem, or these are medallions, not coins, because heaven forbid you use the word coinage. So this is Bernard von Nothaus's adventure. He's a crazy guy, by the way. I mean, he's so super saturated with drugs from the 60s and 70s, it's hard to talk to him sometimes. I think our first conversation began, you know, I once drove a truck into the lobby of a hotel. <laughs> and you're like, okay, here we go. It's on. <laughs> so then I went to India. And I should mention, by the way, with this whole cashless year, exper cashless year experiment, many weeks would go by, and I frankly wouldn't even notice that I, this was on, and that this was um, my challenge to myself. But I'm a sample size of one. I don't, I don't wait tables or drive a cab or I'm not a bellhop, so I'm just sitting in a coffee shop typing or on the phone. So I can sort of get around using cash, quite, get, get away with you, without using cash quite easily. But when I flew to India, all bets are off, because if you want to do anything in a country like India right now, outside of the airport or your hotel room, you still need cash. Um, this, you know, to buy bottled water, or to pay my translator, or to hire a taxi, uh, to visit some historic temple. You know, I was there in India to report on this mobile money, mobile banking revolution, and yet, you know, we are definitely not there yet. So for five or six days there, the experiment was off. There was no way I, my wife was going to let me go back and do a mulligan on the India trip. So I said, okay, I should probably just use cash here. And so on one of my days there, I met this guy. His name is Sonu Kumar. And he is 23 years old, and he owns a tiny little electronics repair shop in the slums of Delhi. He is full stop scraping by. And I went there to meet him because I wanted to learn essentially about his mobile phone and what he is and isn't using it for. So 
Kumar's experience is interesting because it shines a light on a very complicated idea uh, throughout the book, which is that cash is the enemy of the poor. This is the turn of phrase from a Gates Foundation economist uh, who I featured in the book. And of course, it isn't the cash specifically. If you have a mountain of cash, you're not poor. I get it. It's more subtle than that. It's cash is in convertibility into money in electronic form that it can be so crushing and punitive for the poor because they don't have access to the financial services that all of us are taking for granted. So I wanted to sort of follow cash through someone's life cycle. And Kumar, up until a few months before I met him, when, he, when someone would pay him a few hundred rupees, just a few dollars, for repairing a little radio, he would tuck those, those banknotes into his shirt or a jeans pocket, and soon it would make its way up into a little tea canister stuffed under his bed in his tiny little apartment above the shop. Then every now and then he would travel to the countryside, as people all around the world are doing, to deliver remittance funds to family members. You know, we're just talking four or five, seven dollars worth of rupees, nothing. But remittances are zooming around the globe all the time, uh, Western Union kind of things. It's, I think the latest number I saw was like $500 billion a year. So there's Kumar. He has to take a bus. It's a three-day round trip to get that money to his parents. So now, let's tick through it. He has to pay the bus fare. He's carrying all this cash that he's subject to theft. He has to pay someone to look after his shop. The money in his tea canister now is also vulnerable. Then he gets there, comes home, and you know, for all those people, let alone being away from three days of income generation, what about three days away from just looking for a job? So this is where the costs of cash really start to stack up against the poor. Now, it's completely different for Kumar. So he will get paid by a customer, and will walk across the street to what is basically a pharmacy. It's kind of one of these everything stores in the developing world. And he would take those rupees and he'll set them down on the counter. And then he'll take out his cheapo Nokia brand mobile phone, which everyone in the developing world has. And he will sort of do this face-off with the store owner with some quick texting. And through this process, Kumar's no-frills savings account with the State Bank of India is credited, these 700 rupees. And at the same time, the store owner's account, because he now has the cash, is debited. Right, so now, and this was launched, by the way, by a company called Echo. They're sort of the, the software conduit between the State Bank of India and this guy's phone. And the guy who founded Echo is fascinating to hang out with him. Uh, you know, he'd maxed out all his credit cards to, to launch this tiny company, and he went to take his soon-to-be bride to Kentucky Fried Chicken or somewhere in Delhi, and his cards got rejected. You know, he was totally strung out. It was the end for him. And you fast forward eight or 15 months, and he's... Um, has audiences with Bill Gates and Secretary Geithner and then the President Obama was there and he was part of this very small group of entrepreneurs who got to meet with him because of the power of this tool that he's introducing. So Kumar now has those funds in a savings vehicle which is essential for breaking the cycle of poverty because people are climbing out of poverty all the time but they end up falling right back in. And one of the reasons they fall right back in is because they can't save cash as easily as they can save money in electronic form. So in the developing world, it's sort of the flip-flop of this idea that, oh, it's, I don't want to have $20 on me. I'm going to spend it. You know, I need the, this pain and spending thing. I don't want to part with physical objects. In the developing world, it's just the opposite. If you have cash, it's just turbo liquid. And it's turbo liquid for a few reasons. One is that there are just so many claims, good and bad, on those funds in your pocket. You know, the most terrible ones are uh, the drunk spouse or drunk uncle who's going to beat it out of you. Because, parenthetically, it's almost always women who are safeguarding the family finances in the developing world. Right, so those are the worst claims. But then you have all of these short-term legitimate claims on that money. Uh, a neighbor's leaky roof, or so-and-so's kid needs new shoes, and they just helped you repair your moped. Someone's grandmother needs aspirin, and it's gone. And you can't save for the big-ticket items that will help you climb out of poverty and stay out farming equipment, fertilizer, education, the stuff that all these development experts are, are talking about. And for me, again, as a non-economist, this was completely revelatory. I had no notion that cash was playing this unfair game, and it was so much harder for the poor. But then I started to think about cash in my own life, or more, um, more to the point, plastics role in my life. And that I, if, I, if I don't like cash, I'm just not going to use it. 
But if you really like cash, you have the luxury of the choice. And I could call you foolish for wasting 22 minutes out of your day to go to an ATM to get it. But these are not crushing costs for you, not even the 250 ATM charge. You can absorb that in a way that 2.5 billion people on the planet who are surviving on less than $2 a day, they just can't afford those kind of costs. So this was really um, a significant portion of, of, of the project, you know, trying to understand how these costs of cash are so dis uh, unevenly distributed. Moving quickly now, so from India, I was off to Tokyo. I wanted to talk to some anti-counterfeiting experts about the latest whiz-bang hologram technology. Uh, I went to Georgia to meet with a, a pastor there who could teach me more about end times theology and just why exactly Satan loves digital money. And then finally, I spent some time at a coin show in a small town in Oregon. Uh, I took some of my father's childhood coin collection there, and I wanted to try and sell some of it. This was after the one year without using cash. I should say, by the way, so I don't sound like a total jerk, that my dad was not a big-time coin collector. This was like a 10-month hobby. Then he was on to marbles or something else. But he has these coins, and I wanted to talk to coin collectors because they have a really unique perspective on kind of the alchemy of value and different kinds of value. In other words, a coin collector knows very acutely that there is the value stamped onto the object, and there is market value. What will a collector pay you for that? And then there's this other one, this kind of special sauce value that nobody can measure and replicate. But I sure felt that day unloading some of my dad's coins, which is emotional value. These, these personal values that we assign to these objects, whether it's the Icelandic Krona or the, the five with, with the purple five on it. What is our relationship to this stuff? Okay, I came back, eventually. What on earth did I learn? I really do not think it's hyperbole to say that we are living in this time of monetary upheaval. And there are three general categories for thinking about what's going on. One is this more honest accounting of the costs of cash. I was talking about it a little bit with the poor, but there are many others that I'll discuss in a moment. Secondly, it's kind of booming interest in and enthusiasm for alternative currencies. Uh, Bitcoin seems to be the big winner with media attention right now, but it's hardly the only one. And lastly, technology. You know, where does technology fit into all of this? What does it mean to have everywhere, anytime, always internet access? So let's talk about costs a little bit. It starts very basic. The first one is called cash maintenance. If you are a business, you have to make sure that you have adequate cash on hand. You have to make sure that your employees are not skimming off the top when you are not looking. Uh, you have to store and secure the stuff at night. You have to get it back to a bank. If some of the notes are soiled, you have to get those replaced somehow. And there's this kind of merry-go-round of costs. And some of the latest numbers I've seen, which by the way are in a study that was just published two weeks ago by a group at Tufts University, is that this costs businesses in the US about $50 billion a year. In Europe, it's about 60 billion euros. Big money. Big money problem just to essentially babysit the stuff. Then what we start to do is we kind of zoom out, zoom out, zoom out further with these different costs. So another one is production. You know, with our tax dollars, usually our digital tax dollars, we are funding the production of these objects. So the new $100 bill, some of you might have seen this in the news recently. Uh, we should have it here next month. We should. It's about three years delayed because of a big printing error that emerged a couple of years ago. Uh, they've souped up the 100 with this new anti-counterfeiting technology. And that's supposed to be amazing, and we're all supposed to be wowed by that and feel like the money is safe and authentic. So there's this blue security ribbon on the new 100, and when you tilt the note, you see these numbers moving. It's called the motion feature. Amazing. So the problem is when they put the motion feature through the presses, it folded the paper ever so slightly. It's a little bit like if you accidentally iron over a, a small fold on a shirt. Now you have this really sharp crease. And on the underside, it was blank. Halt the presses, huge investigation. Secret service people have to be trained now to look for this error because somebody's going to smuggle some out. They have to pay all these different uh, analysts to figure out what is the problem. Start it all up again. That's all on you. That's all on us. And then a couple of weeks ago, actually, someone wrote me, essentially a whistleblower, uh, through this uh, dummy Yahoo account, uh, and he or she panned out. Like they, uh, we were able to verify who it was, and they were at the bureau, and they said, we've run into another printing problem with 100, and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of wasting taxpayer dollars. I need to tell someone. 
uh, and he found me somehow, and uh, we wrote up a short thing for the New Yorker really quickly. And you know, this again, this is your dollars at work making these 100s. Now the next question is, okay, we're securing those 100s, right? Because of course, when you put all these counterf anti-counterfeiting to, uh, technologies into a banknote, the government will tell you, okay, it's now it's counterfeit proof. But of course, that's silly. Eventually, the counterfeiters will catch up, and it's this game of kind of cat and mouse or whack-a-mole or whatever you want to call it, as far as staying ahead of counterfeiters. So many of you probably know it's the U.S. Secret Service's job uh, to protect the authenticity of the currency, as well as the highest offices of the land. Okay, well, one Secret Service guy I talked to for the book, he said, 90% of our workload has nothing to do with protecting the president and other high offices. 90% of our workload is chasing down quote unquote meth heads who get the bright idea after three nights without sleep that they're gonna bleach a bunch of $5 bills and using desktop printer technology, reprint the image of the 20 on that same paper. They, you know, they get to a gas station, they buy some Gatorade and beef jerky before they're caught, and yet I have these guys from an entire government agency telling me this is the bulk of their workload going after these people. Even if that's a gross exaggeration, what if it was just 20 or 30 percent? I, I feel like whatever your politics, wouldn't you be interested in trimming government a little bit there? So this is, has to do with sort of the cost of securing cash. Then we can talk a little bit about where it lives. Where is that one trillion dollars estimated in U.S. physical currency out there, aside from this giant pile in a safe house in Mexico. It's about $200 million that you're looking at. Uh, this is some big drug bust from DEA. They snapped this picture. And that's your answer. So about 70% of US $100 bills live overseas. So they're not doing what cash is intended to do, which is facilitate commerce. They're being used as a store of wealth. And for, I should say, for many people, in a totally innocent, above board way, you know, people who are worried about the stability of their own currency, they want to hold dollars. So you can't really fault those people, but again, what are the 100s doing? But of course, what they're doing most of all is enabling uh, the drug trade and the gun trade and all of these various criminal activities because crooks love cash. It's anonymous, that's the whole point. And this is where you can start to say, well, okay, even if killing cash is way too radical for for you right now, what about the stuff on the margins? You know, the penny and the nickel, totally worthless, can't buy you anything, we make them at a loss. $100 bill being used for this? This is exactly why we got rid of the $500 bill and the $1,000 bill in 1969. It was to impede criminal activities. And it gets worse. You know, one of subgroup, you have sort of the development types I was telling you about before with mobile money. They're really keen to see not just getting rid of cash per se, but enabling the poor and people who don't have access to financial services, they want to enable them to have options. On the other end, you have groups like the Pentagon. The Pentagon wants to see us get rid of cash. So why? Why, why on earth are we doing that? So if you think about wartime Iraq, post-war Iraq, uh, post-war Afghanistan, again, funded by you, we are flying C-130s full of U.S. paper money into these countries. To grease the economy, yes, but also so that our troops and investigators uh, have funds to buy water, to buy some help filling a sandbag, to buy some information. These people want dollars and they want euros. Well, unfortunately, the Pentagon has noticed that all of those dollars come back to haunt us in the worst imaginable way. Because if you are a very bad person in the mountains of Pakistan and you want to buy some materials, for making an improvised explosive device. There is no more fungible, widely accepted, fast, convenient, and anonymous medium of exchange than a 200 euro note or a $100 bill. So they love it. So the Pentagon, you know, they've high ups there saying, we need to promote these, these mobile money tools, these digital tools. And there's an interesting um, case study that for me is, is valuable because it ties together a bunch of these different threads. Um, the Pentagon's interest in fighting corruption and enabling um, the poor to have sort of a better um, financial stability or access to tools that might help them build financial stability. So the study was in Waziristan in Afghanistan. They took about 30 cops. And for the first time ever, these cops would be paid by way of an electronic transfer direct into an account instead of cash. So here comes payday and all of these cops they look at their phones and they think it's just a joke. What, who, 
you know, we didn't get a 30% raise. No one told us about a 30% raise. Someone's just pulling our chain here. No one was. This was their salary. But for the first time ever, this commander who had been helping himself to about 30% of everybody's cut, he was cut out of the equation. You know, you cut out these, these middlemen. Uh, and you, again, are getting, you're, you're eating away at corruption. You're eating away at the use of those dollars that can damage things so badly for us. And you're helping people save. The last thing to talk about with the cost of cash is kind of the big kahuna. It's this thing called the tax gap. Very boring term for something very important, which is the gap between what we owe and what we pay. Uh, Americans are really uh, good. We pay roughly, according to the most recent audit, about 84, 86% of what we owe, we cough up. Not bad. Unfortunately, that 15% or so account, uh, accounts for roughly, I think the, the best numbers right now, are 400 to 600 billion dollars a year. That is lost revenue to, to government. Now, is all of that cash-enabled evasion? Of course not. You know, you, we all know, have heard of offshore accounts, et cetera, and big companies that aren't paying their taxes. So a lot of it is, is digital anyway. But uh, IRS estimates, actually, they use a number that is 50% of evasion is because of cash. And this group at Tufts, uh, their study from just two weeks ago, they said, you know what, we want to be even more conservative than that when we talk about the cost of cash. So we're going to say just $100 billion a year is lost because of cash and under the table transactions. Now, you, some of you probably know that government also profits nicely through the process of providing us with the currency to use. It goes by this beautiful word called seniorage. And the idea is that if you are the sovereign and you get to make the money, you get a nice profit too. In other words, it cost me a three, three, let's say it cost me seven cents to make a dollar. I, abracadabra, I just made 93 cents. It's a really good business model if you are the sovereign. So, you know, there's a lot of profit for government out there through this process of providing us with, us with cash, and they have a lot of incentive, Treasury does, to keep doing this. But the conversation that I'm interested in sparking or hoping to, that I can spark is that there's no dialogue between all of these agencies about what, is, what are the costs and benefits of cash to them, because Treasury makes a lot of money through seniorage. But DEA is getting clobbered because these thugs love to use cash, and the Pentagon doesn't like cash. There are 10,000 bank robberies in the US while I was writing this book. These clowns, they don't take almost anything, like 40-something million dollars, not, and most of it gets returned. But we all have to clean up the mess. Insurance for the banks, and PTSD therapy for the bank employees, and we have to pay, you know, Department of Justice has to go after these crooks. FBI is investigating all of these uh, bank robberies. Then we have to prosecute and incarcerate. That's all on us. So where is this conversation between all of these different agencies about the cost of cash? Because maybe, just maybe, FBI, Secret Service, DEA, they would say, you know, we'd be okay to demonetize the $100 bill. Let's bring this into the sunlight. Let's give this guy two years to turn that in and get a bunch of 50s and see what happens. You know, no one is saying that getting rid of cash will get rid of crime. You know, that's asinine. But I think you'd be uh, equally foolish to say, you know, those 10,000 goons who were trying to off banks in the United States during the year and a half for me, not, surely not all of them are so tech savvy that they can then sort of uh, rebrand themselves or uh, as, as digital sleuths or, or super hackers and steal money. You know, you're, you're trying to impede crime, not, not completely get rid of it. So section two here is this idea of alternative currencies. And again, anything can be a currency. These stones are the famous uh, currency used on the Micronesian island of Yap comes up a lot in economics classes when trying to teach people about what is money and what is a currency. And the answer is money is whatever we as a group believe it is. You know, we could start transacting with Iowa State dollars tonight, this whole group, as long as we infuse it with value by way of our faith. And the same thing happened with the coins, I'm sorry, the stones. So, so much so that actually these things are as, as big as like a VW bug. So if I have to pay someone a dowry, a lot of times they would just, someone would keep it in front of their home and not move the object, but no one cared because the idea of ownership transferred just fine because now you can use it in some other transaction. It's the ownership that's moving. And that might sound wacky until you think about how you use money nowadays. 
And when you send a PayPal payment to someone, or even just get paid, and these zeros and ones on a distant server are moving somehow from, from your employer to your bank account, that, that is money, that is currency. So with alternative currencies now, we're seeing um, an explosion, really. Some of the more straightforward examples are things like airline miles. Fully functioning, alternative currency, people know it, value it right away. Uh, but they're also kind of everywhere when you think about things like Disney dollars. This is an important example, I think, um, for a reason I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute. But people think it's kind of unserious and cutesy, and I think it's the opposite. I think it's really illustrative of why alternative currencies are powerful. Um, there's something called the Brixton Pound in London. There's something called Ithaca Hours in upstate New York. Burke Shares in western Massachusetts. Then you jump online and this st stuff is really going wild. You have World of Warcraft gold. You have Linden dollars in Second Life. You know, these are viable alternative currencies. They're trading with the dollar back and forth with huge market value. Bitcoin now is up to $1.5 billion. You know, nothing compared to national currencies, of course. But the point is people are starting to use it. So why are they using it? Why are they interested in this stuff? So one trend that is fascinating to me is a lot of people are coming to these alternative currencies from very diverse ideological and political perspectives. So first of all, you get kind of the, the economics equivalent of the eat local ethos. In other words, why do I want to buy a coffee table at CrateAndBarrel.com that's made in India with my Visa card? You know, none of that money stays in my community. You know, it's the same deal with buying locally produced uh, vegetables, et cetera. So I want, I want to buy from the furniture maker down the street. And a way that I can do that and promote that kind of keep the money local attitude is by using the Ithaca Hour or the Brixton Pound. Another thing that's drawing a lot of people to alternative currencies, privacy concerns in a big way, especially with Bitcoin. Again, with, I don't want all the snooping. I want to uh, evade the credit card industry and advertisers and government or I'm I'm just paranoid that that might happen someday, so I want to use this stuff. And Bitcoin is especially attractive to that because it's built on mathematics and it has this fancy cryptography uh, buttressing it. So, you know, it's not completely anonymous, but it's, uh, it's very close. Then you get a lot of these people who are sort of the digital equivalent of gold bugs. Um, they believe that the U.S. dollar is um, inflating and tomorrow or next week we will have uh, Weimar Republic style hyperinflation here and uh, you can just you can bank on it and so I want to be holding on to gold or a digital equivalent of it in something like e-gold. And again Bitcoin is interesting because it's it's wrapping um, it's wrapping a lot of these ideas together in one. In other words you get the privacy enthusiasts who say yes to Bitcoin. And then you get these people who are worried about the value of the dollar. When they talk about the value of the dollar and their anxiety it's about the money supply. And we've all heard this stuff in passing. Oh, they just keep printing more money, just keep printing more money. It's going to cost me $10,000 uh, to buy a sheet of plywood or a hot dog next year. So Bitcoin is attractive to them because the money supply is fixed. It is not determined by a group of humans sitting around a mahogany table. Uh, it's, it's an algorithm. And after the year 2041 or whatever it is, there will be no more Bitcoin created. Now, some people will say this is exactly why this is not a viable currency. You need more money in a growing economy and to grow economies. But for other people, it's just like gold. They love that the supply is fixed, that guarantees this scarcity and protects their value. So one other thing that's pushing people toward these alternative currencies is, is everyday people seeing value in them. A little bit like airline miles, but again, my favorite example is Disney dollars, right? Okay, you're going to the Magic Kingdom, you can use your Disney dollars there, that's really cute. But if you are a family of five in Denver, and you've been saving up for a trip to the Magic Kingdom now for five years, you know, you're just on the edge, but this is something you really want to do for your kids. And you learn that using Disney dollars while you're there will confer what amounts to a 10 or 15 percent discount on all of your expenses while you're there. Well, now Disney dollars are not just some cutesy, unserious thing. There is real value there. So people will jump to that. They will really use it. What, what I think is, is fascinating about this alternative currency thing is also thinking now, I mean, we've just come to the five-year anniversary of the collapse of Lehman. And 
to me, you have the recent Great Recession in tandem with things like Bitcoin. And what has happened, I think, is that there's been this grand awakening for people that they're starting to realize that the national currency is not my only option. Now, the disclaimer is you should not go sell your dollars and buy Bitcoin or buy Linden dollars or World of Warcraft gold or anything like that uh, tomorrow. I don't know where these currencies are going. But it's kind of broken the spell because a lot of people are just so busy trying to earn a living and pay their bills that they don't have time to stop and wonder about what is money and what gives it value in the first place. Why do I use this currency? And the dollar is incredibly powerful. But it shouldn't be the end of the conversation about what money is or, or really what money could be. So now we're on to technology. This is sort of the third prong in this idea of, of monetary upheaval. And the reality is we could talk for weeks about uh, payments, startups, and mobile banking, mobile money tools, new personal financial management products that are helping people be more careful with their money. Uh, Square, that a lot of you have probably seen recent, in recent years, it's just taken off. Uh, and now Square is allowing you to send value to someone directly. Uh, then Google answered within the same week, saying that you could send value uh, by way of an email message through Gmail. So the technology stuff is just too big for all of us to hit right now, by the way, because we're in Iowa. Love them. But I, I want to just share three quick ideas on the tech front, and then hopefully during some question and answer time we can, we can discuss more of this. The first one is that this is the way of the world, whether you like it or not. And especially anyone here who is in the banking industry, uh, there's a really stark anecdote that I, I, th I think is important. This friend of mine, uh, who's in his mid-40s, he's not a, a tech enthusiast per se, uh, he was doing a small house improvement project in, in Portland. He bought a house, he's gonna do improvements and then uh, rent it out. So he got a loan from a bank to do the reconstruction, then he got another mortgage to pay off uh, the reconstruction loan. And he had a great relationship with the woman at the bank who had sorted out this reconstruction loan. They were really good people. She came to have beers when they celebrated the open house, blah, blah, blah. And then he said to me one time, after it was all done and they paid off that loan, he said, I can't have an account there anymore. I love Jenny. I can't have an account there. Their online banking thing is like circa 1992. It's driving crazy. You know, online banking is a ridiculous turn of phrase now. It should just be banking. And you all, if you don't know what mobile check deposit is, you will soon enough. All of these tools, this is the way of the world now uh, to deploy these tools. And they're adding a lot of value to people's lives. And the banks that get it, um, you know, I think the banks that get it, they're not going to die. And the ones that are kind of obstinate about this, uh, they're, they're in trouble. Another area that I think is worth keeping your eye on with technology is this thing called social commerce. Um, there's a group up here called Chirpify. It's with the little blue bird in the corner. Um, so social commerce is this idea that nowadays we spend so much time in social media um, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. If someone you know there is talking about a terrific book or a band or a piece of clothing or, or a financial product that you are interested in, you have to leave Facebook or Twitter, go find the thing, use the credit card network, which is anachronistic and cumbersome and expensive, to make this transaction and then eventually you'll get back on Twitter. So this idea of social commerce is can you enable those transactions quote unquote in stream? Could you just reply to a tweet with certain language and a certain character string and boom, you just bought it, that's it. Uh, and the guy who started Chirpify, his language is we should, be, we should make buying things feel just like shoplifting. Now that is really scary to some people and, and actually it's uh, the final point that I want to introduce here because a lot of people don't need more help parting with their money. So, in other words, it goes back to this idea of pain and spending, debtors anonymous. I, I need help keeping track of my money and with more responsible financial behavior. Don't tell me you've got this tool that's going to help me so I get to feel like it's shoplifting. That's not what I need. But here is my response to this idea that because of pain and spending, we should keep cash around. You know, I think that is really short-sighted because 
we have shown that we can come up with digital tools to compensate for human frailty. Think about when you get an email reminder that a, credit, that a phone bill is due in a week. You know, that's just a, just a nudge in a direction toward more responsible financial behavior. Right? Some people would say it's social engineering. I think that's a, rather uh, over the top. You know, it's a helpful tool, just like a speed limit is a helpful tool. So the question becomes, how can you recreate the pain in spending in digital form? And one way that I imagine this is, let's say I'm using my cell phone somewhere, and I'm about to make some impulse buy that I really shouldn't make, and the transaction doesn't go through because of this app that I've downloaded that says, if you're going to make a purchase more than X hundred dollars, you need to sing some god-awful Billy Joel song at whatever decibel level for the transaction to go through. Or you, know, you could engineer anything, that a teenager needs to call home, or that a teenager needs to do something really embarrassing to help them be more careful with their money. And there's one really good illustration of this from the banking side. There's a startup called Simple in Portland. And they have something called locked goals. And for any of you who, you, who use something like Quicken for personal financial management, you'll be familiar with goals. Uh, same for Mint.com. You know, you, you're saving for a trip to Hawaii or uh, to buy someone a, a present or an engagement ring. You set this goal. You've got to save this much money every day to get there. OK, so locked goals takes that one day further, one step further. <clears throat> so let's say, uh, where are we now, mid-September? Let's say back in July is when I sat down with my spouse and we established the saving goals, et cetera. Then in September or October, in a moment of weakness uh, at my favorite store or at the bar at 2 in the morning, uh, I'm going to treat everybody here to martinis. So then I go to the cash register to check out and because of the locked goals, my simple issued Visa card will not run the transaction. I have, in a, in a moment of strength, I have uh, protected myself from an inevitable moment of weakness. And it's just, just nudging ourselves in the direction of more responsible financial behavior. You know, I've seen another app where you see banknotes on your screen, they're on fire. Right? So you're trying to recreate that emotional response that comes from parting with the object. Now, to finish off, because I'm a tiny bit behind already, on cash, you know, do I think we're going to get rid of cash in four years? Of course not. Four, Fourteen years, probably not. But I think once you start about, once you start to talk about twenty-four years from now, you are just kidding me if you make these confident predict projections about what we can and can't do with technology twenty-four years from now. Think of where we were. And the reality for me is actually this question, this um, this polarized question of whether cash will go extinct or not is, is much less interesting. You know, we are marginalizing it. We're pushing it toward the edge of a cliff. And it doesn't really matter to me that much if cash is, ends up to be just like a payphone or just officially gone, completely gone. It's these forces that are pushing it to the edge of the cliff. This new technologies, this more honest accounting of the costs of cash, and all this enthusiasm about alternative currencies. That's the stuff that's really impacting people's lives, people's wallets, how they live, building financial stability. You know, that's the stuff that I, that I hope people are, are taking away from the book and, and yes, from this talk. Um, and with that, I will wrap up. And uh, please, you know, I hope you'll step to with some questions and comments, and especially the defense of cash, because we haven't heard any of that yet. And, and it is out there. So thank you. There's a microphone. I'm, I, I can hear you, though. I'll get you next. Please. This is a very good uh, approach. And I think this was kind of opened up. And I don't know if you've studied this yet, but Project Xanadu was one of these areas where they were really trying to experiment with maybe re-diluting how we approach information and, and, and money. And I don't know if you've looked at the Xanadu project up close, but you should really do that. I was going to tell you my own personal experience real quick and ask you a question. Have you ever tried creating your own currency on your own? I have done this. Uh, I did a little experiment like this some years ago, about a decade ago, where I was using Cisco routers as my currency. <laughs> interesting. And it was a digital currency, but it was a physical manifestation. It mm -hmm. was kind of an interesting thing. And it did work kind of, sort of. You know, it was a... It, it had, there was a, you know, measure of value in exchange and stuff like that associated with routers, which was 
favorable because just like the sovereign, I was a sovereign in the digital world, so I understood how to do that. What I do see is money, the end of money splitting into three different directions. And I've seen this since the Project, Project Xanadu project failed in the 90s. And I call it translation, transmission, and transclusion. And this is where I think money is really going to be because value the way it is right now, this one for one, I don't think is that sacrosanct. And I wanted to find out, are you exploring these, what I call, supra divisions of values that are being done with money? Well, I'm not sure this precisely answers your question, but you know, the fact is that 10 years ago, the notion that we could be living our daily lives with this rainbow of currencies in our, in our wallets is ridiculous. You know, you're not going to hold on to that stuff. What is the conversion rate today with those Canadian dollars or Swiss francs in your wallet, let alone some uh, digital craziness, right? And then you're going to go to a merchant, and what are they going to do? Have a cash register with all these different currencies in it? It doesn't make any sense. But cloud ubiquity and everywhere all the time internet access completely changes that, right? Because now you can really have this rainbow of currencies in your wallet, parentheses, on your phone. And so if transacting by way of Disney dollars or receiving Disney dollars as payment for your uh, routers makes sense for me and my family because we're off to Disney next month, then we can do that. We can do the conversion right on the fly. You know, there's no, there's no there there as far as the tactical object. That's easy. But then, you know, there's, there's really no hurdle for us to transact that way. Uh, so that's part one. And then part two is kind of, um, and maybe this is tangential, is really just pushing harder for the P2P so that you and I can make that transaction directly. And we don't need all these intermediaries getting their hand in the pot, giving this a three-day time delay, et cetera. We can, we can tra transact the way we want to and so that um, we are simultaneously reducing the friction of money um, while also creating more value for ourselves because, you know, with the Disney example, I think is easy in, in that regard. But does that help a little bit? And Xanadu, I don't know about, so I'll have to read on that. That, I think, will be the one that be, should be a, a different eye-opener for you, and I really thank you for coming here with, with your discussion here. Yeah, I thank hope you. So. Hopefully, people will look at the plethora of stuff that we have, um, the passport system like they have on the iPhone, for instance, exactly enables what you're talking about. There's value being distributed as tickets and redemptions and all these things. There's these other systems that'll show up in Google Wallet and so forth. I would like to see in your exploration that you look for somebody that's enabling like a tool that lets anybody create their own currency, the currency of David Woolman, the currency of Right. I wouldn't Dan. trust the issuer. I wouldn't trust the issuer to control the money supply. I would just keep making more. <laughs> right? I mean, that's the problem. Like, that's why people... Well, listen. I think, but there is, with the P2P banking, I think there is a... Right. You should grab me after so I can make sure to get a few more questions. Thank you. Yes. In your estimation, do you think uh, smaller entrepreneurs like Duala have a chance uh, against latecomers but multinationals that, you know, products like Top Money and TripAdvisor... Right. So the question is about newcomer startups like Dwala versus uh, the big dogs or startups that have big dog backing. Um, you know, it's definitely a David and Goliath scenario because um, they, visas of the world just have so much firepower to bring to bear on a problem. Um, but startups like Dwala have a number of things going for it. Number one is Visa has such a great advantage, but they still want you to use the old plumbing. You know, they control the network and they want you to use that network, the one that's been around for 40, 50 years, whatever it is. And if the dwellers of the world can convince people that, um, you know, A, w teach them what a network is, and then B, convince them that this is superior, I think that will resonate, especially with young people. And I think another thing that they have going for them is mounting frustration with the credit card industry as it stands now, with merchant fees or, um, you know, sort of cannibalizing or, or um, predatory practices with, with the people who can least afford it. Uh, so that, that stuff angers people, and I, so there's a hunger for an alternative, but, you know, it's this scaling question of can you get enough merchants accepting it and people willing to, to
to use it. But uh, you know, I'm bullish on Dwala. I think they're they're fantastic. And that's not just you know in Gracie. I don't know if they're here or not, but but it's you know it's a really fascinating product. You know they're getting lots of accolades and it works. I mean you can see the thing working. Uh, unfortunately, when I look for merchants in Des Moines, as I did this morning, like who accept it, orange dots pop up everywhere. At home in Portland, not so much yet. And so how do they how do they get over that hurdle? Yes. Right. Right. So, right. So the question has to do with people's fears of, of hackers, or I'll just expand a tiny bit because it's uh, it's there and it's going to get asked. What about the big power outage when all of our gizmos lose their juice? So, one answer, and it's only a punt really, which is that we are already in the digital money soup. Most money is electronic. If that big solar flare comes or the hacker comes, they can pilfer most of your everything already, unfortunately. So maybe we need to do something about it now, not wonder about the digital money future. But for older people who, well I should say, for people, especially older people who are anxious about these technologies, you know, this is our legacy and it's a healthy legacy to be um, worried about new technologies and their security. In other words, I don't know if it was 50, 60 years ago, whatever it was, when they started putting radios in automobiles, people were panicked. They thought this was going to be carnage all over the highways. You just can't do this. And they did it. Not everybody died. Some people actually saw value in it. And now we're all listening to NPR or whatever we're listening to in the car, and that's good. The same thing with online, or just e-commerce. Now, remember all of this about, like, I'm never going to enter my credit card on a website. Are you crazy? Now, that's hardly fail-safe, by the way. But enough people see a value proposition in it that they do that risk analysis in their minds, and they say, it could happen to me, but I really need to buy the plate that suctions to the counter so my baby doesn't knock it off. I'm buying this thing right now. I don't know where that example came from. So, yes, I do. So people, once they see the value proposition, they say yes. Another one that I think is great is mobile check deposit, right? So for those of you who don't know what that is, you receive a payment in check form, and you used to have to go to a bank or an ATM that accepts deposits, and that's how you got the money into your account. Now you can take a picture of the check with your phone and just kind of zap or flash or send the value to your account, to your bank. That's it. You don't have to go anywhere. This frightens people. You know, where is my money? What is just up in the phone? What if it's, is it going to be like a dropped call? You know, it's one thing if AT&T drops my call, what are they going to drop my money? That's very different. There's no calling back. But then they learn from a friend who's using it or a friend's 20-year-old uh, daughter who's been using it for six months. And they see it in action. And they see this value proposition and they start to wonder how many hours per month or year they were driving to a bank to deposit a check. And they now there's billions and billions of dollars that's being deposited by way of mobile check deposits. So, you know, once people see that value proposition, they just they get over those anxieties. And that's not to say they're not warranted. That's not to say the systems are fail-safe. They're not. No monetary system is without its flaws. The question is, can you mitigate those flaws so that, that people are willing to participate? And not just monetary system, by the way. Same for a payment system. You know, the credit card network is hardly flawless. But it's also not, I mean, they're, they're making some money because <laughs> some people are, are saying yes to, to that business model. So I think, I think it's just, you have to think, okay, not six months out, but let's think 16 years or 26 years out for, for those people who are anxious about those technologies. Because the people who are students here, you know, they're all going to say, I imagine, like, I never use cash. Why would I do that? It's just a liability. I hope you do, because otherwise I'm foot in mouth. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Please. Um, it seems like a lot of what you're talking about is just more efficient transactions as opposed to divorcing these transactions from some sort of government assurance of, of contracts. And so when you talked about Ithaca dollars and so that's a way to keep dollars local, it's a way of forcing dollars local because no one else will accept them. Yeah, except so the those question is, okay. what is going to be the role of, of government? I mean. 
cash is one thing, but at some point what you're talking about is how do you maintain universal acceptance right. uh, if you're sort of democratizing the, the issuance of, uh, right. of currency? Well, uh, and thank you for using the phrase universal acceptance, by the way, because it helps. So one of the reasons national currencies, especially the dollar, are so successful is you can use them everywhere, except on an airplane. Right, so uh, to me that's a really healthy example that like, again, you don't have to accept this stuff. And um, the idea really with alternative currencies, you know, some are trading back and forth with dollars, but Ithaca hours, you know, they're not dollars. They're this alternative currency, but they trade with it and you're supposed to report income for taxes. Uh, and there is a, can't remember what they call themselves, but it's sort of a monetary policy committee that determines how much new money to inject into the, the local economy. But, you know, our fa people's faith, or lack thereof, in that institution is, tracks perfectly to the Federal Reserve. I mean, the Federal Reserve has more tools at its um, disposal with which to jiggle the handle of the economy, and that is crucial. But there's nothing that makes it any more official or real than the Ithaca Hours Monetary Committee group friends who meet, you know, in sandals with a cocktail. It, it just isn't. You know, it's only our sense of officialdom and our trust of the dollar that makes the, the Federal Reserve that much more kind of powerful in our eyes. And I'm not sure that precisely answers your question, but... Right. Right. So, and a lot of these alternative currencies, they're not necessarily keen to achieve universal acceptance, really. Like universal acceptability, especially a quote-unquote local currency like Ithaca Hours. The whole point is to keep it local. And even though you say you'll never use it, you might travel there someday and a really good friend or colleague is going to take you to the local bakery and you know, you're also going to dinner that night and if you get your change in Ithaca Hours and it confers a 20% discount on your dinner, Maybe, you know, maybe, and that's the idea. And you, you can scoff at it, but then you say, well, I use airline miles. You know, I've injected that alternative currency with faith. I don't believe they're going to evaporate and be gone. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, you know, again, they're, they're not necessarily gunning for universal acceptability, but they do have this challenge of conjuring trust, and that, of course, is a, a challenge that national currencies and their stewards have, have really stepped to, right? We, we trust in this thing. Um, or, as I put in the book at one point, you know, in God we better trust because there's no there there. There's no there's nothing that makes a dollar a dollar except my belief that that you'll believe in it too. Yes. Uh, my question, is, oh, my question is kind of similar to his though. But at the end of the day, like the federal is, or the Constitution protects the the government's right to mint and, mint coins, right? So when does when does and they extended that right to obviously to make dollars as well. Um, when does like government, when we're talking about, especially maybe if we're just talking about electronic money in general, how much of a role will they play, or should they play, I suppose, in developing things like Dwell? I mean, I'm, I'm a huge Dwell fan, but like at the end of the day, Dwell is a private corporation, the government is not, and so is Visa. Right. So it's not that clear what government's role with some of this is. I mean, there are regulations that these companies have to abide by, right? Um, but it's really a moving target. Uh, in other words, you have an alternative currency like the Liberty Dollar launched by Bernard von Nothaus. There are lots of other alternative currencies. Why was his so troublesome? Aside from this outsized voice who said, you know, pick me, pick me, prosecute me. Um, you know, but if he hadn't worn shirts that said the U.S. Mint can bite me, and if he hadn't taken interviews that said um, this is a competitor to the U.S. dollar, you know, that it, we could still have Ron, Poller, Ron Paul dollars around today. You know, I don't know who's going to use them necessarily. He'll claim it's the most, you know, the second most popular currency in America. That's sort of part of his shtick. But, it, but it's out there. So, so where is the line for treasury? And this is especially a moving target with Bitcoin. Uh, and we were talking about this earlier at dinner because there's nothing to shut down. Right? So there was another alternative currency called Liberty Reserve recently that was total money laundering operation like in Ecuador or something like that. And it was clear what they were doing and it was easy for the feds to step in and just crush them, as they should. Bitcoin is totally different because there's, no, there's nothing to shut down. It's a distributed network. So you, could, um, you can sort of eat around the edges. You can't operate a Bitcoin exchange in the United States, or you can't, I'm not sure what it would be. You know, you can't pay your taxes in Bitcoin. I don't see that happening. 
But you know, if the servers are located in Sweden or Sydney or wherever, there's, there's no stopping it. So it's really um, a question that's in play right now, the role of regulators and the role of government. Um, but I, I feel, again, that especially with Bitcoin, it has sort of broken the spell for us. And w people have kind of woken up to the fact that, wow, what is currency? And why, why do I use the dollar and not these other things? Or even just getting people to wonder about alternative currencies. Bitcoin has really done that. And if Bitcoin goes under, you know, there are 20 more Bitcoin-like uh, systems out there that are waiting in the wings, looking to have their chance at the plate. Uh, some of them exist already. And so I think that uh, the floodgates are kind of open with these alternative currencies. But if Bitcoin goes under kind of dramatically, it may really set things back. And people will say, you know, maybe just, just dollars. I mean, hasn't that already happened, though, a little bit with, with, with Bitcoin? So Bitcoin's interesting because it's, um, it's like if you've heard anything about it, it's that people use it at silkroad.com for illicit transactions. And if you've heard anything else about it, it has these wild prices and wild swings in, in, in value. And that keeps everyday people like us from, from buying it, from owning it, maybe other than like a $10 worth experiment. We're just not going to do that. We can't, I can't afford to be that risky with my money. And yet, a lot of people are saying, especially all these people in Silicon Valley who are really bullish about Bitcoin, they're saying that is the early days its value is due to speculation, and that's why you get these wild swings. And if enough people are using it, it will have transactional value, and that will chill the price out. And that's what's been kind of interesting, because Bitcoin did have all these one or two episodes when you would have thought it was over. And it, it survived, and it survived pretty well. Um, you know, I don't know where it will be in eight months, but um, it's really unlike anything anyone's ever seen. That sounds really pat, but I do think it's true, actually. Thank you. Yeah, maybe one, one more. And then please find me after you have some lingering questions. But. Mm -hmm. where everybody stopped and somehow all these dollars become bits and people who gamble or, or aren't very good at it are constantly having to attempt to accumulate all the dollars and they kept it there. Now they're bits. Their dollars are just bits. And you now think they're bits. You can think on your screen and they're bits. So you have to somehow Mm -hmm. what, what I don't think will happen is some gar big government mandate that says, let's kill cash. You know, it's, it's foolish to think that way. It's much, more, it's much more like the present. You know, Canada got rid of the penny, and the Aussies got rid of the penny and the nickel and the dime. In Scandinavia, they're up to like the 50 cent piece, because it doesn't make sense to produce this stuff at a loss. And, you know, we've got, we got rid of the 500 and $1,000 note in the 60s earlier. And, now you have a Dwala, or you have PayPal Mobile, and you have all these tools, and, and all this accounting of the cost of cash. So it's, it's being marginalized naturally by the marketplace. And that's why I like to use the payphone analogy. It's not like the government's saying, like, as of this date, no more payphones. You know, it's just becoming increasingly obsolete. So eventually, you know, my son will be at an airport, like, sitting, sitting at a payphone, you know, where they have a little booth, you know, typing on whatever, on a hologram of a keyboard. And he'll just be like, what is this thing up here with the numbers? You know, no idea what it is. And I, I, I wonder if that's sort of cash is fate. But it should not be some kind of uh, fiat declaration, no pun intended. We, we are kin. Thank you all very much for, for coming. And